Thanks to Life Technologies, Thermo Fisher, for inviting me to give this presentation. It has been a long day for everyone, and I'm lucky that you had a short break, so maybe you are, have recovered and have some time to spend with me on my talk, which will be a more general one. You will see a few things which are familiar, but I also like to point out a few new things, and also I would like to speak uh, on behalf of our European Research Consortium, the European Forensic Genetics Network of Excellence, which includes 15 groups, and we are doing quite a lot of work, and some of it uh, you might also be able to discover in my presentation. Well, of course, we have been talking about forensics, so it starts already. Next. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Um, we have been talking about forensics every day, and you know these wonderful TV shows, CSI, and uh, there are a couple of colleagues who have used the word of the CSI effect um, and its impact on our work, and I think it's a twofold impact, and I would like to cover both areas um, where there are misconceptions about the efficiency, the success of uh, our crime scene investigation. The forensic DNA is an important part of that, of course. And, uh, hmm. Okay. Maybe the old one was better, I don't know. Well, the first one is um, a confirmation bias, because everyone is so convinced that DNA is the most powerful piece of evidence in the forensic world that everyone believes these results without questioning their interrelationship with other data. And that could mean that you, you fall victim to a confirmation bias. You're expecting a certain result, and then you see the DNA profile, and they say, oh, it must have been him. Or you go get a profile, search the database, find the culprit, and he has a previous conviction for something similar. Oh, and you say, oh, it must be him. And you maybe disregard some evidence, which uh, is also in the case, but is not so visible. And so it could be that correctly observed DNA profiles may lead to wrongful conclusions, and you should be aware of that. And I will show you some example. It's, it's a made-up example, but I'll show it to you in the end. Oops. Well, that was too fast, as usual. Okay. No. <laughs> Here we go. So there was one more sentence. And that is the important one, which I'm concerned about, because I'm running this European project, and we are really desperate to acquire more funding for the European uh, group of uh, scientists active in this field. The point is that, that CSI creates the impression that everything can be done, everything is perfect. You have this machine, you have some blue light in the background, you throw in your sample, you get a print out who the culprit is in the end, and there's no problem at all. And the real reality is quite different. We are still struggling with a lot of small things. We are trying to validate new technology which doesn't yet exist. And, but the impression, the public, is that this is, everything has been solved, everything is working smoothly. We don't have to spend so much money on this anymore because every problem is already addressed. And that is not true as well. And it may lead to the fact that uh, maybe the politicians, whoever are the decision makers about new calls for research proposals, say, oh, we don't need this. This has been covered, and they do this for 20 years, so there are no problems. And that's not true as well. And uh, I think uh, we should be really uh, uh, worried about that. OK. So um, this is a statistic about the European databases for the last 10 years or 11 years. And you can see that there's an increase of persons, a fourfold increase of personal profiles and a fivefold increase of uh, crime stain samples. And you can see that there's a gap on top. And the gap is about 1.4 million unsolved crime cases European wide, which means these are cases where there is no candidate who could be a donor of this DNA profile. And the question, of course, is how do you get these people? Um, how do you catch an unknown criminal with a known DNA profile? That is, of course, difficult. And we have had some information already today how this can be done. But there are some other things uh, which uh, are really very efficient. For example, to improve the database workflow, to make sure that 
all the relevant people are ending up in databases. Um, the second part, you should raise the other hand, yeah, maybe that works. The other part is to harmonize legislation European-wide because the criteria for putting someone on the national database are quite diverse in the European countries. And there are still countries who are struggling to get a good legislation uh, to, to have a database or to make the legislation work so that the database can finally be introduced. So these are the things that are technologically, politically also really important to make sure that uh, we get better and more profiles into the database. Oops. And this last point is even more important, which is the European uh, DNA Data Exchange, the PRIM Treaty, which is improving over the years. It becomes more and more efficient, and we can see it by the number of match reports that we receive every week or every month from other European countries. Some of them quite significant, others more difficult, and there's another problem because all the European countries, they have old records in their database uh, which only use a limited number of uh, markers, and there's a short, a small overlap only between the different STRs, which means that there are a lot of adventitious matches between these national databases possible. If you, for example, only have five STRs, Germany started with five STRs. One of them was SC33, which nobody used at that time, so you have four only. And, and now we have about uh, uh, eight million people in Europe in the databases, and it's very easy to get an adventitious match with four STRs when you have eight, eight million people in the database. So this is something we really have to work on. And of course, that is why we are sitting here, investigate new genetic tools that can be used for higher resolution of, uh, sens and, and sensitivity of sample detection. And the second one is, of course, to make predictions about properties like the biogeographic ancestry and externally visible characteristics. These are the things that we can really use to contribute to, to provide new investigative leads that are beyond the current set of markers that we have in our uh, repertoire. So this is an example and some of the data uh, you have seen from Chris already, so we'll just go briefly over it. Um, you can, uh, for example, use the HID panel. We did a validation study uh, last year and we have been collaborating with uh, several laboratories uh, to, to look at the performance of this uh, marker set and, uh, for the workflow for the PGM using different control samples, inter-run controls, inter-lab controls. We checked the results with the genomic databases. We made sensitivity studies and looked at mixtures. You have heard about that already. So just briefly, there are some concordance data which look quite nicely based from our own experience, the inter-lab comparisons and the inter-run comparisons, which are both quite fine. Uh, the largest group here is Strange, the colors do not match here. On my slide, the dark blue is red, actually. Um, I'm not sure how that happens. Um, I don't know. Well, so this, this, the, um, the blue bars are the no calls, not the discordant ones. The discordant ones are just at the top left here, so it's just a very small proportion of SNPs. I don't know how this happens. Let, let me check my presentation later. And these are the sensitivity data that Chris has already discussed. Uh, we have here some... Um, series of dilutions and the laser. I think we don't have to use it. Here you can see it now. So this is one group of uh, data uh, with 10, nanogr 10 nanogram, 1 nanogram, 100 picogram, 50 picogram, 25 picogram. So these are the lowest concentrations. And you can see it only at the very low concentrations of uh, 50 and 25 picogram. You have a significant number of uh, uh, dropouts and poorly performing SNPs at the concentrations of 500 uh, picogram and above. It really looks quite nice. And these data are in publication. If the next bar comes, okay. Paper is underway. It's currently being reviewed and resubmitted and hopefully will be published quite soon. Hmm, I'm not sure. Maybe the old pointer was better. And then we have the uh, European uh, panel, the Global AIMS panel, that uh, was also briefly discussed by Chris. We are currently analyzing the data, uh, trying to establish uh, the reliability 
and it looks like that this pen is really a very nice alternative and it would be something to consider once um, we have done all the validation studies. The SNPs are known already because the, the theoretical paper has already been published, so the companies could also pick it up to include that into a commercial panel, for example. And then we have this famous genetic photofit image uh, that we are all working on, which is, of course, very elusive. Uh, it's more an idea at present, because uh, what we can do, eye color, skin color, hair color, is nice to have, but it's not really decisive. And in many parts of the world, it doesn't basically work. If you go to Africa or to Asia, uh, you don't have to worry about the, the hair color and the eye color. That's not really quite helpful. But in Europe, it could be something quite useful. The hair morphology is something, curly hair, straight hair, thickness of hair, there's something that could be useful if you find hair, of course, and if you can use it, and if that is the relevant information. Like same like male baldness pattern, pattern, which is a genetic trait, and body height is more difficult, very elusive, because we need very large numbers of SNPs to get a very small proportion of height difference. There are lots of uh, genome-wide association studies which have tried to extract data relevant for that, and it turns out to be a very difficult thing. And the same is true for facial characteristics. Um, so, and these are very uh, difficult markers because these are polygenic traits where there's an unknown number of genetic markers hidden to produce a phenotype. And this can only be done by screening large numbers of individuals uh, based on certain criteria, and this is very costly, requires money, and only large numbers of samples will give enough statistical power to, to lead us to some significant data. And the first paper uh, has been published last year on it. Probably all of you have seen it from Klaas et al. Plus Genetics. They've really tried to identify a basic set of uh, markers which are relevant for a facial shapes. And uh, using a certain system of uh, decision-making and selection based on sex, ancestry, and a number of other criteria to come to some um, information. And they have finally ended up with a set that allowed them to make some uh, useful prediction, uh, which in this particular example looks quite convincing, but in many other cases probably will not look so convincing. So this is still a long way to go before we really get anywhere. And I can promise you that this will still be a very long way and very costly to do, but uh, we'll have to do it, of course. Well, another area that I would like to talk about is much more successful, which is the identification of uh, body fluids and stains. And the question, of course, is when you have something which is sticky and red, is it blood or is it something else? And sometimes it's something else, of course. Um, but still, uh, if it's on a crime scene, uh, we have to make a decision whether it's blood or something else. And as we all know, there are a number of marker systems that you can use to discriminate, discriminate between body fluids and tissues. And the nice thing is that we can integrate this in our normal workflow. And not talking about ion torrent, I'm just talking about our standard uh, CE uh, workflow. And all of you, all of you who do not have a PGM yet, uh, they can do all this work, and I will show you a very nice method how to do it, and it's easy to set up if you have some uh, experience, um, and maybe uh, you should look into that, because you can collect your sample as normal, then you make the uh, dual extraction for DNA and RNA, you get two aliquots, one contains the genomic DNA, the other one contains the RNA. For the DNA part, you do the usual stuff, typing STRs, and then for the RNA, uh, you uh, have to get the mRNA, you remove residual genomic DNA by DNA's digestion, then you make the reverse transcription to cDNA, and then from the cDNA, you can make a PCR amplification using endpoint PCR with a uh, se uh, selected uh, set of marker genes, which are typical for the body fluids of interest. And we in Euroforgen, we have um, validated a multiplex, uh, which was developed uh, by the NFI in Holland, which I would like to introduce. And it can be done quite easily in the normal routine casework laboratory. But you have to consider a certain number of features that RNA has and which is quite different from DNA. And I would like to point this out because it's really important. The expression levels of messenger RNA are variable. There is no black and white. There are lots of shades of gray 
in, uh, in the level of expression of particular genes. And it, it can vary by cell type, by person, uh, and of course with a physiological condition. If somebody is healthy or ill, whether he has exercised or is relaxed, has a strong impact on the expression level of particular genes. And if you look at the data, you have to take this into consideration. And if you do not have enough markers, you could miss information and, and could misidentify uh, the cell types. So you need always several markers for a particular cell type or body fluid that you would like to look at. And the second point is uh, that the uh, mRNA expression uh, does not mean that certain genes do not uh, copy or are not expressed at all in other in certain cell types. So there's a risk, for example, if you put too much RNA into the system that you overload your data and then you get a, po a wrong positive result because you get a sort of baseline expression brought up to a very high level because you add too much cDNA into the assay and then you get a very strong signal. And the alternative is that you get a false negative result um, if, the, if you get a lot of RNA, but it's not human RNA, but maybe from some other contamination like bacteria or plant or whatever may be in your sample. So what you need to do here is one thing is to first determine the optimal amount of cDNA uh, uh, for the assay and then to make replicate analysis to sort of uh, eliminate some stochastic variation that may happen when you analyze uh, these uh, um, RNA levels because using endpoint PCR um, you cannot really quantify your result. You just get a yes or no result. So you get a peak, then you see a signal, or you get no peak, then you uh, have to ignore it. But there's no um, there's sort of message in between. The only way to do that would be by real-time PCR. But doing a 20-plex by real-time PCR is really hard to do. And uh, so therefore, most people are using endpoint PCR for this purpose. So this is the multiplex that we have used for our validation work uh, that was published last year. Uh, it's a 20plex with markers for blood, for saliva, for semen, for skin cells, for menstrual secretion, for vaginal mucosa, general mucosa, and three housekeeping control genes. These are very important, these housekeeping genes, because they allow you to make an assessment about the quality of RNA, whether you have enough specificity for human-sourced body fluids or tissues. And furthermore, um, to make sure that you are not falling victim to some variation in the expression level, um, the, the idea in this essay is to make, a, uh, make four replicates of the cDNA amplification. And then you make a complete assessment of all four replicates in a single analysis, and you have a scoring system. And only if more than 50% of your markers are positive for a particular body fluid, then this result is considered to be positive. So this is how it looks like. It's a little bit complicated. You, on the top of the slide, you have the four replicates, and the peaks, of course, are the signals for the particular genes. Then below, you have a matrix uh, for the different body fluids. And let's look at the blood on the left. There are three blood markers, HBB, CD93, and Amica1. Uh, these are the uh, correlating results. And you can see that HBB and CD93 are all four positive. Amica 1 is negative, but it means that you have um, 8 out of 12 results positive, which, which means this sample is positive for blood. And another example is uh, the saliva. Here you have uh, STAT H and HTN3, and you have uh, eight, uh, sorry, uh, 7 out of 8 uh, results positive, which means also that saliva is positive. Then semen is negative. I don't go to all the results. The individual skin is strongly positive, and then the mucosa markers are negative for menstrual secretion and vaginal mucosa, but the general mucosa marker is positive because there's saliva in it. And the reason when you have saliva, then you may also have uh, uh, mucosa expressed, and that uh, is uh, uh, the control. And then you have the, five, uh, the three housekeeping genes, which are all 12 results positive. So this is uh, actually a quite nice method. We used that in a collaborative exercise among the laboratories, and we got quite nice results. You see here on the next uh, slide a validation uh, study uh, where we used uh, clean cDNA for the different uh, types of body fluid. On the top, you see blood, saliva, semen, skin, secretion, and vaginal mucosa. 
in different amounts between 1, one microliter and 0.2 microliter. And then on the left side, you see all the different markers. And then in the middle, you see the percentage of positive results among the participating laboratories. And you can see in the middle line from the top left to the bottom right, you always have these 100% signs, which means that this is the specific result for blood, for example, for saliva, and so on. But on the right end, where you have the secretion, the vaginal mucosa, there is some sort of variation because of menstrual secretion always contains some blood. So you have positive blood results as well. And also for vaginal mucosa, you sometimes uh, get some uh, cross-reaction, uh, both with blood um, or with skin. And uh, that uh, makes it a little bit more difficult in the uh, interpretation, of course. But this is important to know, because if you do not understand the system, then it's very difficult to make the right conclusions. But using these validation data, actually, it's also possible to get accreditation for such an essay. And that, I think, is a very good starting point. And everyone who thinks about using uh, next generation sequencing for this type of analysis, I strongly recommend to start with this method first, to get an idea of how RNA is behaving and how you have to modulate your results to get into the right range of analysis. And then you can uh, use these data also to, to, to compare it to the sequencing results uh, from, from cDNA, from NGS data. Um, this has been published last year already, and it's a very nice paper to read. I strongly recommend you to look into this if you want to use that essay for your own casework. Hmm. OK. Yeah, of course, um, the question is, um, when shall I do messenger RNA analysis? Is it something for every single case, or uh, does it depend on the circumstances of the case? And I would say, yes, the latter is the better choice, because um, you have to consider the scenario uh, of a case uh, to, to see which types of samples may to, maybe have to be considered. And uh, typically, sexual assault cases are the most complex ones, and they mostly can require this type of analysis because it may help to reconstruct what has happened. Whereas, for example, in the large number of volume crime cases like property crime, uh, these type of samples normally do not play such an important role. But there are other types of samples which are important. Um, for example, when you look at the uh, uh, contact stain, skin or saliva, uh, this is something that you can find in every burglary case. Um, for example, we always have these situations and somebody breaks into an apartment and they find a bottle of beer and open it and drink it and leave the bottle there and then we can swap the rim of the bottle and get a very nice DNA profile. These things are sometimes quite useful and then uh, maybe the, the defense lawyer comes and makes some claims on how this DNA profile got there. And then if you can say, oh, it was, it was from saliva, it might be a nice information if you can show that. So sometimes you don't need these large multiplexes, a small one might be more handy. And, um, for example, in our lab, we have uh, developed a small pentaplex, um, which is specific for skin and saliva. On the left end, you see the three skin markers, and on the right side, you see the two saliva markers, and we get a very nice discrimination between these two types of body fluids, whereas um, the saliva works really very well. The skin markers sometimes drop out. They're not so reliable, but that depends, of course, on the age of the skin sample. If, if, if the, the skin cells are not really fresh and they are sort of from degraded material, you might not get enough RNA uh, to get a, a signal. But no result is better than a wrong result. So basically, you cannot make a mistake there. Yeah, well, there's, so mRNA is a very nice investigative tool to complement our current uh, casework analysis. The DNA tells us who has deposited a crime uh, seen sample and the RNA may tell us what was the biological source of the samples, although this may not always be true because there are difficulties uh, which we may call association fallacies, which means that you're wrongfully associating a DNA result with the body fluid information. There have been cases in the literature where this has been documented, and uh, also there's a paper also by the Dutch group from the NFI who very nicely show that the peak heights and the strength of the RNA signal is not at all correlated with the amount of DNA in a particular sample. So you may get a very strong RNA signal and may get a low-level DNA profile. So you cannot always associate the result uh, from the RNA analysis directly with the particular DNA profiles. We really have to make sure that you make the correct uh, uh, associations there. 
And RNA requires a few additional skills in handling investigating samples because RNA is a very fragile uh, molecule, so you have to be uh, very careful regarding the contamination with uh, RNA's enzymes that may destroy your samples, and you may have to make a decision before you start with the case whether you want to do the dual extraction strategy with RNA and DNA, or whether you just go for the DNA. So you have to make a decision about the correct analytical strategy. We have some new data from our group that we collected over one year. Uh, six labs have co collected all that data from one year. A total number of 27,400 casework samples were analyzed regarding the type of sample and the success rate. So the success rate was measured in terms of the uh, DNA yield. So we, we compiled the quantitation results and calculated the total yield of DNA extracted uh, from a particular type of sample. And then made a big statistic. Uh, we had 44 different categories of typical crime scene samples, uh, each category between 16 samples and more than 7,000 samples. And of course, as everyone would expect, blood stains and cigarette ends are very successful ones, but also collars of clothing like a coat are also quite useful, much more successful than uh, handles of a knife, plastic bags, or plugs and cables. But this hasn't been really shown systematically. Um, all samples involving human body fluids are quite successful, of course, but the important information is that 32%, one third of all the samples investigated were contact stains, touch DNA samples, trace DNA, which is a really large proportion. And about 20% of these gave a useful result, which is quite a good number, and that's the main reason why this is being done. And uh, so the, the, the usage of these contact stains and these difficult samples has really increased a lot over the last years. So this is a very complex graphic, and I'm having my difficulties to explain that to you uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, what you see is from the left to the right, the different types of samples. On the left side, you have the successful categories like blood and cigarette ends and everything in hum involving human body fluids. You see the black line in the middle. Um, this is the five nanogram line. So the total yield five nanogram normally indicates that you will get, in any case, a full DNA profile. So that's the threshold for getting a full DNA profile, not per assay, but for the total yield of the sample after extraction. Um, then on the right side, uh, you have the more difficult samples, the contact stains. The three uh, columns on the right, right are human tissue samples like muscle, bones, and teeth. So they are a special category, and they are always quite successful, of course. And then you see these small diamonds. These small diamonds, the black ones, indicate the proportion of mixtures in each sample type. And you can see that... Um, and there's a scale on the left between 0 and 100%. And the highest proportion of mixture, for example, in the middle, uh, you can see here uh, when you go to plastic bags, yeah, which is in the, in the center, then a little bit more to the left. Um, uh, I can't read that myself, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I had to, to memorize that. Then you have tape lifts, um, which are also uh, a high proportion of mixture. And then there are other samples like... Uh, blood and semen, uh, which are normally no mixtures. And I think uh, from looking at these data, which we will publish in some way or another, uh, we can make some conclusions about which types of samples are best to collect at crime scenes so that they can be used to advise uh, the crime scene people what they should watch out for and how they should collect their samples to get the best success out of their uh, crime scene data. And if you don't do that, you may have trouble because you have all read in the news that there have been several cases um, uh, where there were problems in court, in, especially in the UK, um, where there was a miscarriage of justice because some database searches were done with DNA profiles which were due to a contamination and then the wrong person was accused, um, although he was completely innocent, and there were other difficulties um, that were due to a number of fallacies that may happen when you make mistakes in the, in the interpretation of the evidence. And I would like to talk about that part as well, which is, I would call it the evidence challenge. And it's getting more and more relevant for us because we are looking more and more at these low-level contact stains, the trace DNA samples, where we do not know where they actually came from. And that makes it so difficult to understand uh, 
what has happened at a crime scene when you observe a DNA profile. And what we're doing basically is we're just observing DNA profiles and nothing else. And we always, if you get a full profile, we always can unambiguously assign a DNA profile to a person if the person is either one of the suspects or is in one of the national databases. That is not the problem. But this is what we call the subsource level. This is just the genetic information, nothing else. It doesn't tell, you, tell us anything about how it got there. And that's ex exactly the point. For example, if we have this DNA profile and it was recovered from a knife handle, then the next question is, where was it obtained from? Uh, has the DNA profile originated from skin cells, from a contact trace? And if that was the case, then we have the source level. The source level means the type of tissue or cell uh, that was the source of the DNA that was used for, the, for generating the DNA profile. And, but if we have not done our RNA test, then we do not know whether it was skin or saliva or whatever. And then the next question, of course, is this knife was used uh, because somebody was stabbed with it and maybe hurt or killed. And then the question is, when were these cells deposited? Were they deposited when the victim was stabbed with a knife? And this is called the activity level. And these are three different levels that have completely different meanings. And we have to be very careful how we put our own results into a context of such a crime scene scenario. Because the activity level, uh, I mean, if it's straightforward, you say, okay, it was him because he used the knife and he killed the victim, and so we're going to convict him. But maybe it was different. Um, and maybe the cell were deposited when the knife was used to cut a tomato on the day before. It has nothing to do with the crime scene. How do we know? There's no timestamp on the DNA sample. Or uh, was it deposited by secondary transfer? Maybe the true perpetrator was wearing some gloves, he touched a door handle, uh, and then he took up some cells and deposited these with his glove on the knife handle. And the person who is now being accused has never touched the knife. How do we know this? We have no idea. Or maybe uh, it was um, not skin cells, it was a saliva trace. And, it, it, and how it got there, nobody knows. So this is really very difficult. And I think this is our major challenge right now when we look at our own results. Because we see these profiles every day and we always have difficulties to make a story out of it. And sometimes it's better not to make a story out of it, because if you do it wrongfully, then you are a victim of this so-called association fallacy. And uh, that means um, that you sort of uh, use the strengths of the evidence that is assigned to the DNA profile, the matching DNA profile, and you associate that with the activity level, saying, OK, I found this DNA profile on the knife handle, so it must have been deposited when the victim was stabbed with a knife, and so this guy was, is, must be guilty without considering any alternative explanations. And we all do not know very much about all these issues which are connected with DNA transfer. This is something um, which needs to be researched very intensively. And I know especially our Australian friends have done a very good series of experiments in the last few years uh, looking at the persistence of DNA profile at direct and indirect transfer scenarios. But we need many, many more of these studies. I've been this year to two uh, very high-profile court cases in Germany where always the, the situation was that indirect transfer was invoked by the defense to explain why a particular profile was at a crime scene. And it is so difficult um, to educate the court um, that this is a realistic possibility under certain circumstances. This is the CSI effect, you know? People think it's his DNA, so it must have been him. And also, sometimes it's the opposite. It's, there's no DNA profile. So my, my defendant is excluded because his DNA is not at the knife handle, which is also possible but may not be true. How do we know? We need these experiments. We need many, many more of these experiments. Of course, we cannot uh, test every single crime case scenario and put it into a research experiment. But we need to have some uh, realistic statistical data about how DNA survives under certain conditions, how it can be taken up and transferred to another location so that we have some ideas what may have happened uh, in a certain casework scenario. So this is my uh, idea of research for uh, some of the next uh, few years. And we um, all like to publish, and um, I just want to remind you that we have been very successful in the last 10 years 
publishing our data. You may remember uh, this Science Watch publication from Thomson Reuters uh, talking about forensics, and we must be very proud to say that um, the European research labs um, are leading in this area, at least until now, because in this list of uh, successful institutions, there are among the first 20 institutions, there are 14 European laboratories, five from the US and one Australian. But we do not know whether this will be true in the future. When you look at the publication record, um, you can see that this is from Forensic Science International and Forensic Science International Genetics uh, from a period of five years until 2013. You see a decrease in numbers of papers from Europe. You see an increase in the number of papers from the US. And if this sort of uh, tendency continues, uh, it is the result of a lack of funding for this type of research. And you all know in your national sort of funding uh, scenario or the possibilities that you have for forensic research that there is only a very limited amount of money available. At the European level, the same is true. We are really struggling uh, to convince European uh, authorities in Horizon 2020. There's this famous security program, and you have seen the call which was published which uh, has one topic that is really related to forensics at crime scene, but it's, it's nothing that is attractive for us in terms of academic research. And this is really what I call the main problem. It could be the reason why we have this picture of uh, decreasing numbers of publications. When you go to the United States, um, I collected uh, and coll um, co um, calculated uh, the amount of money that was put by the NIJ into the forensic DNA research. And this is DNA-only research, and it's only academic research. They have put much, much more money into backlog programs of unsolved cases and stuff like that. But this is an average of $5 million every year for research grants for academic institutions. And this is, there's no match for this in Europe at all. Our Euro, Euroforgen project, we have 6 million euros, but for five years, for 15 labs, it is, which is roughly 200,000 for each lab, or 300,000 for, and this for per year. This is really uh, not a match for this type of funding, and I don't know where the money should come from. This is really something that con concerns me quite, quite a bit. But still, at the end, I would like to talk about Euroforgen. We have a build a network, which we call the Virtual Institute of Research in Forensic Genetics. We have about 180 laboratories participating. It's a very nice group of people, and we'd like to bring them together uh, more directly. We now have the possibility to join individually, not as a lab, but as a person. You just have to apply for a username and password, and you go to this website. Uh, you find it here. When you go to networking activities, you click on it and you go to the European Virtual Institute. You have to apply. There's an online form where you can apply. If your lab has already been registered, then you get your password directly. If not, then you have first to respond to a questionnaire. And if you have your password, you get to another part of the website, which is in green, which is restricted for members only. And there, you get more privileged information. You get all the publications from our group, the full papers in PDF format. You get information about software, uh, background information, and you get training information about issues that are relevant for everyone. And we are going to improve on this part over the last two years of our period of funding. We are going to add training material, and we would like also to offer online training uh, that you can do some self-education studies. And this is really, I think, a very attractive system. We are really hopeful that we can do that. And so this is just uh, my last few words. We try to really use our resources that we have to connect European laboratories. We have done some research projects which have been published, and some of it is known to you, and we have talked about some of it. There are three new projects that have joined us for the last three years, which are quite interesting as well. And we have our Train the Trainers series of workshops, and some of you have participated in those. They are invited to participate, which is free of charge. We are covering all the costs, but we expect you to go out and uh, work as multiplicators of information to make trainings in your own national context. And then we are going to establish these online resources for training and education, learning tools, and we have a very nice part of the project that is 
uh, dealing with ethical and legal aspects and with the social uh, societal dimension of forensic genetics. We'll have a special uh, conference next year, and we'll have a session just devoted to this part, which I think is very important because there's a lot of diversity among the European laboratories when it comes to the uh, relevance, the impact on the society, and the ethical issues in terms of uh, what are we allowed to do and where are the limits of forensic sort of genetic investigations. And with these words, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, one question. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Euro Fortune, um, the facilities that you mentioned, will they also be available for international labs or are you solely focusing on European labs? Um, well, everyone can join the group. We are not restricted to Europe. We have already have members from other continents, so that's not a problem. You just have a, received an application from Peru and they are happy to participate. And I think. We also have an Australian lab who is sort of collaborating. I mean, the information that we offer is free. And I don't make a difference between European and non-European labs. I don't see the point there, of course.